you talk about the United States, you talk about a country who, who, who citizens have always believed that they were born in, in a state of original virtue. I laid down an ultimatum to Kiev Ukrainians. If you go ahead down this road with this agreement, we're going to cut you off, not just militarily, financial aid, economic assistance, no ties with the European Union. We're going to pull the rug out from under you. Russian musicians like Anna Netrebko had her contract with the Metropolitan Opera broken because she had once shaken hands with Putin. So, I mean, this this kind of juvenile behavior is just another sign of the psychopathological state of Western political elites. And what they wanted to do was return Russia to its status of being nothing but a minor player on the margins of Europe that it was under Yeltsin. And then, of course, when, when Putin came, and in this magnificent feat, whatever you, you think of anything else, I mean, to reconstitute a truncated, amputated country, all of whose public state structures had collapsed, Putin always wanted collaborative relations with the West. When we get all of those documents uh, uh, published after the last summit meeting between Putin and Xi, you lay it all out. They're talking about a partnership which goes way beyond alliance. You know, look at some of the consequences in historical terms. For the first time since Genghis Khan, all of Eurasia from Belarus to Beijing and beyond is at peace. You know, maybe Biden deserves the Nobel Peace Prize for these accomplishments, if you like. When we talk about these wars after the collapse of the Soviet Union, especially when we talk about Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, now in Ukraine, and maybe in Taiwan, we end up with one word that is neocons. Who are these people that we are calling them neocons and what's their agenda in your opinion? Well, I wrote, actually, I wrote a, a rather longish essay on the genesis of, of the neocons, um, which I could make available somehow or other convenience. Uh, I think there are a couple of points to, to emphasize. The neocons were a distinct group when they first emerged. This goes back to the 1970s, 1980s. But their orientation at that time was domestic. It was a reaction to the counterculture and the radical politics current within the Democratic Party. Uh, it, it quickly, though, came together with hardline cold warriors of a traditional type. Uh, and by the sort of late 1980s, and then even after the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, you had this sort of formidable alliance, if you like, uh, between, you know, the, the old neocons who wanted to remake the world in the American image. And they were emboldened by the collapse of the Soviet Union and the belief that now doctor the, the te- there was a teleology at work in history that would lead every country towards liberal democracy and therefore Kantian peace. You'd have democracy and global into the economic interdependence, creating a huge stake in investment in the maintenance of, of avoidance of, of war and conflict that would disrupt that system. The democratic side of it ensured that the populace, which was assumed in, you know, in Kantian language as being a sort of opposed to engaging in, in wars, would constrain their leaders from following bellicose policies and that could lead to, to hostilities. Uh, and so those were the threads, the streams which, which came together. 
What two other points though are of cardinal importance? One, in strictly power political real politic terms, uh, many of those in the American foreign policy establishment saw the end of the Cold War as an opportunity to establish American hegemony. All of this was very bluntly and frankly stated in the notorious Wolfowitz Memorandum of March 1991. Wolfowitz then had a very senior position in the Defense Department. He drafted a memo which leaked, which laid out in detail a comprehensive strategy for the United States to achieve global dominion. Um, and that entailed, and this was based in, in his mind, in his way of thinking, entirely on a said, power political term. He was not a utopian, or an idealist in any sense. And that included, that strategy included taking preventive as well as pre -act preventive action, uh, or preventive as well as, as preemptive action, to avoid having any other potential power center consolidate and emerge and come to rival the United States. Now, of course, 20 odd years or 30 odd years later, uh, we see the United States sort of following that logic, particularly in its address to China and also, also Russia. I mean, China, which has done nothing really concrete to threaten the United States, has been designated enemy number one because in what has now become the consensual mind of the American political elite, a threat to American hegemony. And so you have a, a uh, some of it stated in economic terms, competitive, et cetera, so you do have a, a, a power military security dimension, you have an economic dimension, and something which is off, which is overlooked and which I think is of great importance is a psychological dimension. You talk about the United States, you talk about a country who, who citizens have always believed that they were born in, in a state of original virtue. And the US was destined by providence, fate, whatever, to lead the world down the path of enlightenment, whether as model or increasingly as, as Asian. And this sense of what you call American exceptionalism or singularity, if you like, uh, has been one of the, how to put it, in a way, one of the foundations or, or this collective of not only collective national self-esteem, but individual self-esteem. And so there are many people who, who, without being conscious of it or stating of it, feel somehow diminished if they are no longer members of this distinctive, providentially sort of faded United States. And this sort of feeds into, right, the, the, the current syndrome and pattern by which the United States and its political elite feeling, you know, in sensing this loss of, of, of dominance and, and prowess, you know, react by more and more uh, ostentatious displays of power as if to reassure themselves that they're still number one and will always be number one. You know, even Barack Obama, who's heralded for being such a man of, of, of enlightened ideals, I mean, he was quoted as saying, the United States is number one and will always be better, number one, you better believe it. This is a public statement of his, uh, and that resonates. So when you, 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 you bring all these things together, you have the current American outlook on foreign policy. And so what has happened in conclusion is that the Wolfowitz doctrine, 
of March 1991, which was at that time was considered marginal. In fact, it was repudiated by the Bush, you know, Bush senior administration when it leaked, right, has in fact become the blueprint for American foreign policy, which almost the entire American political establishment adheres. So that's where we are. And I think this is the, the framework and the context in which you have to understand American behavior vis-a-vis uh, Russia, China, Iran, every place, every place else. When we look at this Wolfowitz Doctrine, it talks about Europe and it has its agenda in Europe. They're using the EU, NATO, these two institutions, and they had they had an agenda for Europe in this Wolfowitz Doctrine. Do you think that they achieved those objectives they wanted? The American policymakers have never been concerned about Europe or the, or the EU or the old Western Europe or the expanded sort of EU and NATO as a rival or as a competitor. In fact, only on rare occasions have they seen it, and this is on objective grounds, as a significant force in the affairs of the world outside of of Europe and now even within Europe. Uh, It's recognized that that the Europeans have no political will, that they're they're caught in a dependency relationship, a, a, a dominant subordinate relationship in psychological terms, and that they are incapable of asserting themselves and taking an independent tack that deviates from American policy, particularly any American policy, uh, which is deemed by Washington of of being great great importance. So you see that on, on Ukraine in which, in effect, the Europeans, and especially the West, you know, the West Europeans, well, the East Europeans have their own you know, very pronounced emotional feelings about Russia for historical reasons. You know, in, in Western Europe, uh, the United States sets the course and the Europeans, like uh, loyal vassals, simply fall in behind it. And don't forget, it was the United States which torpedoed the 2015 Minsk Accords supposedly underwritten by Germany and France. Uh, and although the, the the Ukrainian government of Poroshenko said very quickly afterward it would never abide by the agreement, and that was with the encouragement of the United States. And both France and, and Germany, particularly Angela Merkel, who took it seriously despite a recent statement that she too saw it as just a ploy to buy time. Uh, I think she really did believe it, believe in it at the time. But we put the squeeze on her too. And so the French and, and the Germans did absolutely nothing to encourage Ukrainian compliance with it. And then similarly, in uh, uh, April of last year, after the initial Russian assault, which was intended to scare the Kiev government into reaching an agreement on on, on terms very similar to those of the Moscow, uh, you know, accords uh, seven years earlier, and it worked. It worked politically. And the Zelensky government of representatives met with the Russians in Istanbul and they put on the table an outline of agreement which went very far towards towards meeting Russian objectives. And agreed afterwards we'll review it and we'll meet again. And the United States jumped in and uh, using a, as its envoy emissary, Boris Johnson, that's why. Uh, laid down an ultimatum to Kiev Ukrainians. If you go ahead down this road with this agreement, we're going to cut you off, not just militarily, 
financial aid, economic assistance, no ties with the European Union. We're going to pull the rug out from under you. And by that, at that time, uh, Ukraine was already a, a financial dependent of the West. Its economy was in very bad shape. It was hemorrhaging population. You know, four million Ukrainians left Ukraine between 1991 and 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 and, and 20. 21, of course, they've lost 10 million more since. I mean, Ukraine's population now, apparently, is only about, about 30 million. Uh, and so the Europeans sort of all said, fine, jumped on the bandwagon. War, war with Russia, using Ukraine as a proxy. Uh, we're for it. And the West European situation is, is a bit odd insofar as even less so than the United States, there initially was no popular enthusiasm about supporting Ukraine in an all-out war with, with Russia. But you've had this extraordinary successful campaign of shaping, manipulating sort of public opinion. And then this anti-Russian hysteria has set in, which is a real pathology, you know, universities in Italy, in literature courses, uh, deciding that nobody would read or study Dostoevsky. Russian musicians like Anna Netrebko had her contract with the Metropolitan Opera broken because she had once shaken hands with Putin even though she publicly said she disagreed with the Soviet uh, Russian attack on Ukraine. That wasn't enough. So, you know, we have pathology heaped upon pathology. And unless we realize the pathological state of the West and, 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 and the, the abnormal behavior of its leaders, not just in Washington, but in Brussels and Paris and, and, and Berlin, we're not going to find our way out of this, right? Because we're not talking about rationality or logic or, 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 or realpolitik calculation. We're really talking about a, what's become a, a psychodrama with incredibly dangerous implications and possible consequences. Do you think that if instead of Biden, we had Trump in office, we could have the same result as in Ukraine right now? Yes, we would have. I mean, you know, Trump's, Trump, of course, is a, he's an odd character, you know, psychopath, narcissist, and, and the rest. Don't forget, despite these absurd allegations about his being a tool of the Kremlin, uh, which was just a fantasy thing created by the Clinton uh, people to explain uh, Hillary's loss in 2016. Never had any basis in reality. Um, don't forget that, that uh, Trump turned the screws on the Russians by deepening economic sanctions three or four times in the course of his four years in office. And his rhetoric about China, you know, was was has was similarly uh, hostile. Now there was a certain respect that Trump had for Putin because he admires all leaders who who, who are strong people as he sees them with conviction, and he likes to meet with them as an equal and see himself repl reflected. In, in in there what he sees as positive leadership qualities. So well, that's that's reason for his admiration for strong people, whether a very serious statesman like Putin or a bunch of you know thugs like Bolsonaro in, in your country, whom he celebrated. And Bolsonaro, of course, learned a lot from Trump, as did, did Modi in, in, in Italy. But it would have been no different. If by some not really flu, Trump were to return to the White House, uh, nothing significant would change. 
because the entire sort of worldview, as, as I try to describe it, which now permeates the American foreign policy establishment, there's no alternative to it. Nobody's posing an alternative. It's not out there, and it's not going to come from from uh, Trump and the sort of toadies whom he will be picking if he were to be elected president, whom he would pick as his sort of, you know, senior officials. So, I mean, we can set that element aside. It would have profound implications for the United States domestically in terms of foreign affairs. I, I don't think it would really present any significant alternative. You mentioned those failed agreements, means one and means two, and then Putin was trying in December 2021, he was trying to negotiate with the Biden administration, which failed. And in, in March, as you mentioned, in Istanbul, they tried mm -hmm. to make an agreement. And in your opinion, what was in the mind of the Biden administration? They thought that they're going to defeat Russia in Ukraine. What was the plan yeah. in your opinion? Absolutely. Uh, the American foreign policy establishment uh, doesn't give a damn about Ukraine or Ukrainians per se, except for a few people who've had ties to Ukraine or a close association and identification with the former Soviet states of Eastern Europe, like Poland generally. Uh, no, the, the target was Russia. When the Biden people came into power, the so-called neoconservatives, let's let's use the term in a more strict, restrictive way. Those who were the back of the most aggressive, a confrontational approach to both Russia and China, uh, they're the people who run the show in the Biden administration. And Biden himself, shares their, their view. In the State Department, which for the first time in some years really is the main force in American foreign policy, uh, Blinken, Newland, other associates, uh, the National Security Council, Sullivan, uh, the Pentagon civilian leadership, well, the former General Austin, uh, who's not much of a force, frankly, in administration. Uh, they all share this view, and it's been stated in a number of official documents promulgated by the Pentagon, by the State Department. Um, and what they wanted to do was return Russia to its status of being nothing but a minor player on the margins of Europe that it was under Yeltsin. What they wanted was a Soviet Yeltsin uh, who would open the way to American corporations to have access to both Russian natural resources and to bring Russia into the American directed world financial system. In other words, make it a dependency. Mm -hmm. Of course, they soon became aware that Putin was, you know, a man of, of a different cloth. So as early as 2008, when George W. Bush proposed NATO membership for Ukraine and Georgia, that the American dedication to isolating Russia, keeping it weak, if you like, was a centerpiece of his foreign policy. Now, the maximalist view in early 2021, when the Biden administration came in, into office, was to generate a crisis so severe that it would force a regime change. Uh, and it has been stated. I mean, it's no secret, you know. The notion was, uh, first of all, they grossly understated the, the resilience of the Russian economy. And so they thought that a full-blown sanctions regime would implode the Russian economy. This would lead to massive domestic unrest, 
And this would lead to the overthrow of Putin. And this would bring to power perhaps an oligarch or cohort of people, whoever the leader would be, uh, who would not only be pro-Western, but would be sort of prepared, uh, you know, to serve as, as menials in the American global uh, household, if you like. And they totally miscalculated. Uh, it's Western Europe that has suffered more economically than has, uh, than has Russia. It has led to the consolidation of a, a, a Sino-Russian uh, partnership, which has, you know, through, through the BRICS, created a, a, a counter force and a counterweight to the collective West led by the United States. Right. Uh, and so for the you know, look at some of the consequences in historical terms. For the first time since Genghis Khan, all of Eurasia from Belarus to Beijing and beyond is at peace, political stability, and uh, nothing but uh, conciliation and cooperation among its main components. It's also led to and encourages the reconciliation of Saudi Arabia and Iran, which nobody would have conceived of even a couple of years ago. The great historic confrontation between Sunni and, and, and Shiite. If you, like. uh, you know, maybe Biden deserves the Nobel Peace Prize for these accomplishments, if you like, if you set aside the war in Ukraine itself. So, so, I mean, there's been a, the whole Ukraine affair has been a strategic blunder of immense proportions. And yet nobody in official positions or even in prominent public positions in Washington or in Brussels or in European capitals uh, states what is now a self-evident truth. And so we're living, all of us almost, in a fantasy world. And, you know, we've been living in it now for you know, sort of two years and a fantasy world, by the way, in regard to China as well. All these silly stories about the Chinese economy uh, going to hell. I mean, China's projected growth next year is to at least double that of the United States and nobody is growing in Europe. So, I mean, this, this kind of juvenile behavior is just another sign of the psychopathological state of Western political elites. And when you get so, that becomes so deeply ingrained, you know, as any psychiatrist would tell you, it takes some really enormous shock to break out of it. What that shock might be, I don't know. I mean, of course, the Ukrainians will eventually be uh, totally defeated by the Russians, the country will uh, be nothing left but a rump Ukraine. Uh, do you say, you know, realism at that point would constitute a, a, a perhaps a recognition of the de facto fact and try to turn, um, you know, a diminished Ukraine west of the Dnieper into a NATO satellite, which would then be welcomed into NATO, and you'd get in effect a a, a new, uh, you know, barrier between not only eastern and western Ukraine, but what you already have, which is an iron curtain between Russia and supporters and the West. But of course, this is far from what the ambitious goal of, you know, the Biden people and everybody else in Washington expected. So, you know, that goal is now beyond reach. So now they're ready to play a game of, of comfort, a new Cold War, total confrontation on a global scale between the collective West and this new power block is appearing, and uh, a no-hold-bars fight 
to the allegiance of, of India, of Brazil, of everywhere. So even events in the Sahel, which have absolutely no consequence for American core interest, is seen through the optic of this new Cold War. Just as during the real Cold War, you know, you know, it viewed everything that happened. You know, if a mouse sort of squeaked in the American embassy in Ascension and so forth, it was immediately blown up into a Cold War, especially an issue. And so now we're, it's sort of an Orwellian world in which instead of three or four blocks, you have two. And that's what passes for strategic thinking in the United States, uh, with no recognition, not only of the dangers of this and the cost of the United States, but uh, of the fact that this is a contest, the, the, the US, the collective West, no longer has the capacity to win. Doesn't mean they're going to lose in a climactic, clim you know, a climactic way. It just means the Western dominance of the world is gradually diminishing. I mean, that's that's certainly apparent. Now, there is nobody. Well, there are a few marginal people, and you've had some of them on your program, you know, on sites that only a few thousand people visit who realize this, and there's some of the best people and some of the best minds, if you like. But in terms of the American political establishment and Western European political establishment, there's no recognition of this. Absolutely none. Whether in London or Bonn or, or Paris or, or Berlin, hey, look at the caliber of the people you have. I mean, you put Biden and Trudeau and Olaf Scholz and uh, Borrell, the EU man, and God knows whom else, and even the mercurial Macron into a room. There's not a strategic mind in there. There's no, no even potential to, to, for a, 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 a reconstitution of their frame of reference of what the world is and what it's likely to be and what that implies for the West place in the world and its, and its policies. So we are really in a bind. In your opinion, what would be the future of Ukraine? Are they going to leave Ukraine as they did in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and leave all this mess behind? What they're hoping for now, and what they hoped about the so-called counteroffensive, right, is that you would create conditions on the ground whereby the Russian leadership would be ready for a ceasefire in place. Hmm? And some kind of partition, perhaps, in the West we consider that an enormous concession, <laughs> the Russians want, right? and uh, then bringing Ukraine, you know, minus whatever territorial adjustments are made, uh, which would be minimal in the scheme of things. Into NATO. Now, obviously, that's not going to happen. This is uh, the, the Ukrainian effort now. It is just the last spasm. They'll have nothing left. And whenever the Russians are ready to launch their big offensive, whether later this fall, the winter, early in the spring, uh, you know, they'll be on the on the Nyapa. And Washington and the West have absolutely no idea what to do at that point. Because, like all fantasists, they're unable to conceive of alternatives to their fantasy image of the world. You think that with the situation of Ukraine today, are they going to be able to join the EU or even NATO? Well, there'd be a lot of pressure. Let's say the Russians are in Yepa. Now, of course, the Russians would use that position in a way to try and prevent even a rump Ukraine from joining NATO like West Germany in 1954, whenever, whenever it was. Uh, you know, how, why, what would happen is unclear. As far as the EU concerned, 
Well, I mean, the EU itself has become quite wobbly at this point. Mm -hmm. And if you were to invite the Ukraine, it would be in contradiction of all of the standards and all of the precedents. Mm -hmm. And it would be simply assuming responsibility for a basket case country. Right. As it is now, the Ukraine government is, is unable to pay its army, is unable to pay its civil servants. It's the United States mainly and Western European governments to some extent who pay the bills, which is also why back in April of last year, the threat of the United States to pull the rug from under it, oh yes, there wouldn't have been any government. They wouldn't have been able to, to finance even the, the, the basic operations. So nobody thought this, thought this, you know, this through in the West. And this is really historically unprecedented. You know, perhaps the closest thing to it would have been, you know, during World World War One when the war went on and on and it was nothing but a mass slaughter on both sides. Nobody had any conception or idea of how, how to stop it. But I mean, this one could be stopped. You just break out the, go back to the April 1 agreement and use that as the guideline and the outline. And you could bring it all to an end in a matter of weeks. But nobody in the West is prepared to do that. And of course, they would open themselves to ferocious criticism from all political opponents, right? um, both opportunistically and because they really believe in the like, anti-Russian cause. In your opinion, why Putin, not even for a single moment, was acceptable for the West? It's a very good question, and, and of course, it's a key question. And there's no clear answer, just as, I mean, you know, and it, it sort of overlaps with the, the question today of what are the sources of this hysterical anti-Russian phobia that has swept the West? And, and you're right, even in, you know, in 1991, 1992, when Yeltsin went down, and you had all these Western advisors trying to overnight transform the command economy of the Soviet Union into a market economy, which was a complete disaster. And, uh, you know, millions of people were being impoverished and, and suicide rates were, were, were spiking and life expectancy was dropped four or five years and so forth. There was some practical technical financial issues, monetary issues at stake. And that is Russia, even in the minds of the Western advisors, very desperately and badly needed a large financial assistance package, IMF type, of the kind that was given Poland, for example, to help it during the transition at the very same time. And uh, Washington and West rejected it even though their man, in a sense, Yeltsin was the guy who, whose political future was at stake. Now, Jeffrey Sachs, I'm sure you know, he has spoken to the, uh, the Russian senior official who was in Washington negotiating what he thought was going to be this kind of sovereign loan to help Russia stabilized its balance of payments as a key element in the strategy, the, the program to restructure the Russian economy. And when he went into the meeting in which he was told by the Americans, nothing doing, you're not going to get any help from us. He said, uh, he's told Jeffrey Sachs, he says, I was completely astonished. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Because it seemed to be very much in the American, in you know, the Western interest to stabilize things in post-communist Russia. So you had this lack of, 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 of empathy and lack of support for Russia from the very beginning. 
And then, of course, when, when Putin came, and in this magnificent feat, whatever you, you think of anything else, I mean, to reconstitute a truncated, amputated country, all of whose public state structures had collapsed, whose economy was barely functioning, and to reconstitute the state, the country, the government within a matter of a few years is a remarkable accomplishment. Hmm. Uh, but he made the West unhappy. And of course, the, the, the punctuation mark was his speech at Davos in 2007, in which he presented the case as to why Russia should be considered a country of consequence and how you know, hegemony was not the best future for the world. And he first talked about multipolarity, not in antagonistic terms, but simply in terms of, of sovereignty, right? And don't forget, I mean, so Putin always wanted collaborative relations with the West. And he did even in in February of last, last year, he was still hoping there could be some kind of negotiated agreement. The only thing was he, they, Russia could not tolerate a hostile NATO-armed, NATO-membered Ukraine. And don't forget Ukraine was pair preparing with American support, backing and arms, a assault on the Russian-held Donbass Republic at the time. In, in a way, the Russian move was a preemptive military exit. But in any case, back back to Putin. And the United States simply rejected this notion in terms of set down originally by Paul Wolfowitz. If you're not within our system in a subordinate position, you're our enemy. And so the, the diminution and the marginalization of Russia has been an American foreign policy objective, what well, you can say since 1991, but more explicitly and more urgently since uh, Putin's arrival and in particular since 2000 and, uh, you know, and seven. Do you think that the As reason... Why this emotional antipathy towards Russia, I don't know, I wrote a piece on this trying to suggest to you know, various uh, hypotheses, none of them seem to be persuasive, but it's there. And that's another obstacle to to the emergence of any sensible policy towards Ukraine, which can only take shape in the framework of a sensible policy towards, towards Russia, and which in turn can only make, take place in the sense of a, a global strategy that conforms to reality, and a reality which is denied by all Western leaders. Once Putin suggested, if you're afraid of Russia, why do, don't you let Russia in NATO? It was rejected. They didn't consider his suggestion. Do you think mm -hmm. that Russia was so powerful to be part of NATO, or they thought they need an enemy like Russia for this military-industrial complex? You know, I mean, Gorbachev's vision, which was also, you know, Yeltsin's in a lucid sense, was also Putin's, right? was to create a new security architecture which would embrace the whole continent, which would be more than a security architecture, would be a kind of political architecture generally, you know, like the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Not an alliance, because what's the point of an alliance? You don't have any enemies. You don't have any threats. Not within Europe itself. And this was anathema to Washington leaders from the very beginning, because, again, what the NATO was an institution that serves as, a, as an instrument of American policy, yeah? kept the European subordinate, and everybody else was to be kept in, in an ambit of 
occupied by dependencies who are not formally members of NATO. That means anybody of, of consequence like, like Russia. Now, some have argued, like, uh, you know, a few people have argued that the that, that NATO-Russia Council, which was proposed and set up as companion to NATO enlargement, in other words, there is such an entity, and, and I don't know what they, they meet anymore, sort of annex, you know, to the NATO building in, in, in Brussels, right? uh, in which there could be exchanges between Russia and NATO. It was never taken seriously. It was never animated, giving any, given any kind of, of light, life. And of course, it was eclipsed by NATO expansion. But that's as far as the West and Washington, particularly, prepared to go in in meeting the the Russian and originating with Gorbachev conception of a, a pan-European security ar arrangement. And that's what, you know, Putin has been, been after, even on informal terms, if not organizational terms, uh, since he's come to power. Don't forget, until 18 months ago or two years ago, he kept referring to the Western countries as partners. That's the word he used. You know, because that expressed the hope that he was holding holding on to, and we wanted no no part of it. But you're not allowed to say this. You're not allowed to say this in the media, in the mainstream media. Nobody who holds this view would ever be quoted or given a chance to write write an op-ed uh, or to appear on BBC or any place. Maybe in Brazil. Yeah. <laughs> it seems it seems that this war in Ukraine and the conflict in Taiwan is bringing these these two events, these two major issues, are bringing China and Russia together. We know yeah. Russia Russia is a gigantic military power, and China is a gigantic economic power. These mm -hmm. are together now in BRICS together with Brazil, India, now Iran, Saudi Arabia, and all of them all of them together, it seems to me that they are creating a situation for their survival system. How do you see this? Well obviously they have. But people don't acknowledge the, the strategic significance of that or to the extent that they do, we say, okay, now we've got to fight them and weaken them. Deny China investment technology markets, etc. Continue to fight in Ukraine and maybe Russia will eventually, the Putin regime will eventually collapse. It's all Alice in Wonderland stuff, of course. I mean, China's manufacturing capacity now exceeds that of the United States and the European Union members combined. It's a reality. Right? And all these little games of trying to, to deny China this, not all the other things, really meaningless. As you say, the, the, the uh, Sino Russian partnership, which predates Ukraine, and which has been developing now for, I don't know how, you know, a generation, of course, is given, as even before the Ukraine conflict, when we get all of those documents uh, published after the last summit meeting between Putin and Xi, you lay it all out. They're talking about a partnership which goes way beyond alliance and is more important than alliance. Now, it's true now they're sharing military technology. They have joint enterprises, uh, exercises, if you like, right? And you, you in, in the broadest sense, as you said, you, you join Russia's unique uh, resource trove, 
with China's manufacturing capability, right? And Russia's advanced technology, military technology with China's own high tech, which is now beginning to be applied to its military uh, systems. And there's no way that you can, you know, marginalize that group or weaken it to, you know, so as to maintain Western American-led hegemony. And then you find, I mean, your country, Brazil and India, Iran, uh, they don't want to play that game. You know, they're not going to join a Sino-Russian bloc in the same terms that China and Russia have brought themselves together, but they want constructive, cooperative, mutually beneficial dealings with them. And if that means not obeying dictates from Washington, as they've made it clear, we're not going to. There is not a single country outside the collective West that has agreed with and accepted the sanctions which Washington and the EU has imposed on Russia. Not a single one in Latin America, in Africa, in most of Asia, except for Japan and, and so forth. Not a single one. So that's really thumbing the nose at, at the United, United States. And then, of course, you, you know, the Saudis and the Gulf Petro states are playing their own game. They want to break away from dollar dependence. In effect, they, particularly now that you have a, 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 a modus vivendi between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and nobody there needs American protection. Who are they going to be protected from? There's nobody. Right? So they don't need American protection. Right? And so, the, the, don't forget, I mean, the deal uh, has shaped relations and the much of the global economy. The oil dump the dollars deal that was agreed in 1973, exactly 50 years ago, between the Saudis and, and, and Washington. Okay. Said in effect, okay, you want, oh my, you would want to raise the prices of oil, which they did at that time. Double it, triple it, quadruple it. We'll accept it. The big American oil companies will ride on the crest of that wave, make a lot more money anyway. But we want you to put all of the earnings in American financial institutions. Buy treasury securities, buy bonds of any kind, even buy stocks. But nothing, you can even buy some property, but nothing critical, right? And in exchange, we'll not only tolerate you throwing your weight around in oil prices and the rest, but we'll protect you. First, from whom? From the Soviet Union, your regional enemies at that time, which were Saddam and Assad in, in Syria, and so on. And that was the deal. And the Saudis now are saying, well, that deal, we're no longer going to abide by it. We're going to do strictly what's in our national interest. And that means, uh, for example, moving towards the de-dollarization of the world's oil and energy trade. And that aligns them with China and Russia, and now Iran. And even the you know the, the, the United Arab Emirates joined joined the BRICS and carrying the same message. And in Washington, what's the reaction? They just shout, "In grace, uh, you guys don't have everything we've done for you. You're going to be eaten up by the Russian bear and the Chinese dragon. You're going to regret this." Blah blah blah. But, but. Meanwhile, by the way, we'd like you to pump more oil and bring down the price of oil because we have a bad inflation problem and the Europeans have a bad, even worse inflation problem and our economy is going to, and going to hell. So you're a bunch of bastards, but still, for old time's sake, we expect you to do us some favors. Well, you see what how far that went.
you know, the Saudis told Biden to stuff it. But that still hasn't awakened people in Washington to the extent to which uh, they really to begin, they feel the need to at least begin to rethink their worldview and American global global strategy. It's it's tragic, and it's it's of historic import, importance. What's your take on what's going on in Africa? This new confrontation between China and Russia on one side and the West, especially the U.S. on the other side. A lot of the Africans, particularly the French Francophone Africans, uh, have had their fill of French paternalism, independency, and and the way in which this has worked to the relative benefit of France and much less so for them. So that's a, an, an emotional element mixed with some hard concrete reality. And then they too are part of and influenced by the global trend to loosen, break free of the yoke that's been imposed upon them by the West, but by the United, the United States. And of course, this makes Washington very un- unhappy. You know, in, 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 in the Sahel, the United States has military bases now, or had every, every one of those countries, Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, Mali, and yeah. they originally went there to work with the French in dealing with the sort of jihadis coming out of the Sahara. Those jihadis, in effect, were spin-offs of the collapse of the Gaddafi regime, um, which opened an arms bazaar, really an arms smorgasbord, so all of these jihadi groups could just acquire any weapons they wanted. Uh, don't forget Gaddafi hired thousands and thousands of, subs- of, of, of mercenaries from the Sahel. They were suddenly at loose ends. Some of them found a natural transition into these jihadi groups. So the United States established these these bases, but it also, you know, of course, those relatively, you know, small and weak jihadi groups, while well, they declared themselves subsidiaries of Al Qaeda, posed no threat to the United States. They posed the a threat to to local government. But it also, though, I mean, that that provided an excuse for the U.S., particularly the Pentagon, to move a step forward with a long-stated and officially documented plan to establish and to maintain uh, strategic military dominance in every region of the world. The Sahel, well, that's a region of the world. We want to be military dominant. You know, don't forget in your own neighborhood. You can get that that Washington when when Argentina was going through, and that's not as current. It's next to last monetary crisis. Washington came and put the squeeze on. I forget who was president then, and said, "We want the basing rights in Patagonia." Remember. And the, the apparently the Argentinian constitution explicitly prohibits this, but they did it anyway. So the United States says, basing rights in Patagonia, what the hell for? Well, if your objective is to police the globe, well, why not there? I mean, who knows when you might have a, a penguin-led insurgency, God knows what. And you remember Hillary Clinton during the Afghan war when she was Obama's secretary of state. And well, we want to turn Afghanistan into a West, Western friendly country that we could use to block the Chinese building the, 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 the sink, you know, the Silk Road project. This would be a Western oriented rock in that path. You know, a pebble in the espadrilles, if you like, idiotic idea. But that's 
that was and still is the, the thinking in Washington. Not in regard to Afghanistan, which they know is a lost cause. That's why they spent 20 years running around the Hindu Kush, you know, trying to find Taliban. Actually, the Taliban had disappeared by 2002, when they were revived by the United States, very ham-handed intrusions and uh, searching for ex-Taliban as well as al-Qaeda and creating enormous uh, opposition hostility in Pashtun areas. And that's what led to the revival of the Taliban. So, I mean, you got a bunch of real geniuses, strategic geniuses in Washington. And so it's no surprise that they would create this sort of trap for themselves in, in Ukraine. 